Again, my name is Monica Valdez Lupin. I'm the executive director at the Boston Public Health Commission. And uh, the commission is the local health department for the city of Boston. Uh, a little bit about demographics, since Lillian shared that and set up a nice framework for uh, public health department's role in emergency preparedness, planning, and response activities. The city, we're a majority minority city, like Miami, about 700,000 residents. Um, we are, as I said, the local health department for the city of Boston, but what you'll see in my remarks is a uh, theme similar to what Nestor has shared, what our colleagues from California and Lillian shared in terms of the importance of collaboration and coordination in all of our activities. Uh, as you probably all are aware, Boston hosts many different types of events throughout the year. We have uh, hundreds of things that we coordinate and plan around with other uh, city agencies, including races, walks, concerts, um, protests, rallies, and other marches. And some of the big events that have prompted large public health preparedness and response activities include our annual Boston Marathon, which has about 30,000 uh, runners and nearly half a million spectators. Uh, the second that I wanted to highlight is our annual fireworks display on the Charles River. Again, about half a million attendees at that event. And then uh, we were the first city where a free speech rally was held after the Charlottesville uh, protests and following the death of uh, Heather Heyer there in 2017. And this actually required a large scale um, activity and response to counter uh, the protesters that marched throughout our neighborhoods. The event that I'll talk about this morning is related to the Boston Marathon bombings. So in terms of our role as the local health department in large planned events, we're the lead for coordinating uh, the public health and medical response to emergencies that are happening in the city according to our city's comprehensive emergency management plan. The health department is also the lead for coordinating health and social services needs during disaster recovery operations in the city. And to do these, what you see uh, on the screen, we operate what's called the Medical Intelligence Center, and I'll be referring to this in the presentation. Uh, the Medical Intelligence Center, the MIC, is a coordination center similar to emergency operations uh, centers that specifically focus on public health and healthcare partners. We activate for many different types of emergencies, including blizzards, hurricanes, mass casualty events, events, and other large planned events. During the large planned events, uh, we activate the MIC for three primary reasons, and I'll use uh, the marathon as an example to illustrate some of the, the three key functions out of the MIC. The first is really to collect, this is core public health, to collect and provide health and medical situational awareness about the event for all of our partners. So using the marathon as example, you'll see a screenshot of what we, um, is the situation briefing report that we publish through the MIC with all our partners throughout the day uh, before and throughout the day of the race and post, uh, post race. And so uh, this goes out to all of our partners, hospitals, community health centers, and other healthcare facilities throughout the city. The second uh, reason is to coordinate resource needs of public health and healthcare facilities. So uh, in the event of a marathon, if there's a hospital that needs additional resources to deal with patients that are experiencing uh, heat-related uh, events on an extreme heat day, this would get pushed out through the MIC. And finally, we also use the MIC to coordinate social and human service needs of residents that are impacted by the events. And uh, an example of this is when uh, at a race, uh, the marathon, a hospital needs to uh, find help reunifying, reunifying a patient or a runner uh, with their family. So we treat these planned events as opportunities for us uh, to exercise our multi-agency and multi-jurisdictional uh, emergency operations. So what happens when the unplanned happens? For us, the 2013 uh, Boston Marathon bombing turned into this scenario. And here are the impacts that we saw. You see on the slide that we had over 260 injured, uh, three were killed on site, two police officers were killed in the aftermath. 118 patients were transported uh, across nine different hospitals in the city. 
And uh, we had a citywide shelter in place order following uh, the bombings as law enforcement pursued the suspects. The MIC received notification immediately because we had a staff person on site who was deployed at one of the field medical tents at the finish line. Uh, so within minutes, within four minutes, all of our hospitals in the cities were notified of the bombing and all public health and healthcare partners throughout the city were notified in the first 10 minutes. Over a dozen partner organizations that staffed the MIC helped and supported us throughout the response, including the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and a team of mental health clinicians that were on site at the MIC from the US Public Health Service. We provided family reunification, public information, uh, disaster behavioral health support, and ran the Family Assistance Center. In the weeks and months and years to follow, uh, we continued to connect people with resources and support as the city was recovering from the bombings. And with a diverse group of partners, you'll see on the infographic that we ran over 200 sessions of debriefings and disaster behavioral health support, including sessions for over 400 students and 100 teachers at Martin Richards School in Dorchester. And Martin was the youngest victim of the bombing. Uh, one thing that hasn't come up, but we'll probably dig into in the um, uh, panel discussion, is the need for us to focus on workforce protection. And this is actually one of the lessons that our team learned. Uh, almost all of the uh, commission, the health department's employees, live in the city of Boston, and several were direct witnesses. As I mentioned, they were at the finish line working at the medical tents. And when uh, we, we thought a lot about our public safety and healthcare partners, many of whom interacted directly uh, with the patients and survivors, the intelligence analysts who were embedded with our uh, Boston Police Department and the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, who poured over videos over and over again from the bombings, and our call takers at the city's 311 um, call center, who answered over 21,000 calls. Uh, related to the bombings over a two-week period. In that first 24 hours of the bombing, those call center uh, call, uh, staff answered 2,500 calls uh, from desperate family members who were looking for their loved ones. As a side note, you'll see uh, on the upper left hand of this slide a picture of the memorial that we just um, uh, launched with the mayor a couple of weeks ago. Uh, two of these memorials now sit on Boylston Street in Boston uh, at the site of the bombings. <coughs> so what did we learn? Uh, we actually uh, learned a lot in terms of how we as the local health department respond to planned events and how we view resilience in our communities, which is why I titled our slide uh, Boston, Bouncing Forward, uh, Boston Strong. And the three things that really stuck with us and our roles and uh, the, the work that we did with other city agencies and uh, state partners is that we need to uh, better practice, exercise, and drill for these types of events, especially around the recovery support operations. Things like setting up family assistance centers, delivering disaster behavioral health support, and supporting patient tracking and family reunification are often functions that are overlooked in tabletop exercises and different large-scale exercises that we're involved in. Second, the public health and medical response to the bombings has been praised a lot by many people. Uh, and we've been planning, and Lillian brought this up in her remarks, uh, we've been planning and training together uh, with partners across the city and the state for the marathon and an event like this for uh, nearly 20 years. And so long-standing partnerships and relationships across the different sister agencies and organizations were really critical factors in enabling us to effectively respond to the events that day. Uh, the third key lesson that we learned was that when these large emergencies happen, we really need to think critically and holistically about our entire community, not just the area where the incident or the event occurred. And this includes thinking about the resilience of our communities to just everyday impacts of violence and exposures uh, to violence. And this is something uh, that really paid, played out after the, the marathon bombings. Uh, the weekend following, uh, the event, there were several people that were shot in the city of Boston. And we heard from our community uh, members that gunshot survivors in the hospitals that were treated weren't given the same kind of support as the marathon bombing 
of victims. So four examples, uh, the, the day that the, the bombs went off and these patients were transported, there were signs up on the doors of bombing survivors' uh, rooms uh, asking people to keep their no noise levels low and to keep it uh, quieter. And this isn't what happened the weekend after with the, with the gunshot survivors. And so this is something that our community members had raised with us in terms of health inequities and racial justice challenges uh, that have continued to persist. So with these lessons in mind, uh, we've shifted our approach to uplifting and strengthening community resilience in Boston for any event, whether it's planned or unplanned. And instead of just thinking of our role in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event or disaster behavioral health needs, we're really paying closer attention to the needs that the residents have been bringing up to us that impact their overall resilience and ability to respond uh, to, to disasters and traumas in the communities. And we're doing this by using a, a community engagement approach. We have direct responses, as you see uh, from this slide, which is pulled from our website of the different services that we offer. So we provide direct uh, services through emergency medical services. This is unique uh, in Boston. There are only probably half a dozen jurisdictions where EMS sits within the local health department. And we also have a neighborhood trauma team, uh, teams that have been deployed in the neighborhoods that bear the disproportionate burden of uh, gunshots and stabbing um, injuries. And then we have programs like our Healthy Baby, Healthy Child, so maternal child health programs and public health uh, preparedness office focus on supporting people in ways that are building resi resilience and really looking at, at prevention. Uh, to everyday stressors and preparing our communities to withstand larger scale emergencies before they even occur. We have a large organization, so we have about 1,200 employees, 50 different programs across the department, so we can help people navigate not only the services within the health department, but connect them to other city services. So there really is no wrong door for people who are looking for help, and that's our role, is really to play that connecting and navigating role. We recently received a two-year grant from the Barr Foundation. The Barr Foundation is a local foundation that has really focused their uh, grant support around education, and we're really proud that we'll be able to build commu a community resilience network um, in the city. And the work that we're uh, going to be doing is really stemming from the lessons that we learned about community resilience post-marathon bombings. And so with the res these new resources, we're going to be able to build a stronger foundation for our long-term strategy of minimizing morbidity and mortality from emergencies with a specific focus on climate emergencies. So this funding will be used by skills-based training and exercises to residents and communities of color to build teams and networks among organizations, residents, our different sister agencies and city government and support pathways for youth and community leadership development. An example of skills-based training uh, and exercises that we'll be uh, facilitating is around being, having prepared and resilient uh, residents. And so the team is already uh, doing work in terms of providing community-based training. So this will expand on our ability to uh, build a cadre of locally trained individuals with skill sets that can help themselves their family members and neighbors during emergencies. So this is an example of some of those trainings that we'll uh, be providing. So things like stop the bleed until help uh, arrives, CPR, first aid, psychological first aid. And really the, the goal is to build agency among our community members to, to deliver uh, and to provide these life-saving skills. Uh, with this grant, we'll also be building uh, local resilience teams. Uh, and so we, we have amazing uh, community partners who are really strong community leaders and are often our trusted community partners that people go to uh, post uh, events. And so we'll be working with these community leaders and organizations uh, to build on their capacity uh, to keep our uh, communities resilient and strong every day. And the final component is going to be uh, embedding subject matter experts in the fields of resilience, emergency management, climate, racial justice, and equity, as well as our youth and community leaders uh, and organizations. And so this, this slide highlights some of that work and uh, some, screen, some photos of what we've done so far. 
Uh, so just in, in closing, want to point to our, our website, our learning center, which uh, the website link is here. So if you're interested in learning more about our community re resilience work that we're working on in the future, and also if you want uh, specific uh, after action reports or additional materials on the work that we did around the Boston Marathon bombings, you can go to this link below and access those resources and tools on the website. So thanks uh, very much again for hosting uh, this panel. I'm really excited about the discussion that's going to follow.